Hello, I'm just Davilus in here. Um, welcome to today's meeting. We're happy to have you here, whether you're joining us in person or online. We hope you'll continue to participate in whatever manner you feel most comfortable. Um, please, uh, let's start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you'll all please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you again. Um, before we move through the agenda, I want to quickly go through um, registration information and some of our rules and standards for public meetings. Uh, we welcome everyone. And the council's goal is to make the meeting place uh, a place where people feel safe and comfortable participating in their government. We invite everyone to help make this a welcoming space for others. Um, a respectful and safe environment allows us to conduct the meeting in an orderly and efficient way. Our most basic rule is that any action that causes a disruption to our ability to conduct the meeting or any safety concern involving threats or unprotected uh, speech are not allowed. These actions or comments may result in removal from the meeting. We also ask that you avoid profanity, personal attacks, intimidation, or discriminatory language. Comments uh, that include this content are not persuasive to the council. If you choose to use such language, the council may interrupt you uh, or to remind you, uh, or the council, uh, some council members may choose to leave um, and not, not hear your comments. As a reminder of our public comment registration process, individuals may register to comment on a scheduled public hearing item up until the hearing is closed. For the general comment section, we will accept signups until 7.30 p.m. The general comment section is limited to a maximum of one hour and will not include commenters who register, uh, who do not register before 730. So if you are here to give personal comments, or excuse me, general comments, please sign up and remember that it is possible that not everyone who signs up may be able to speak in the time requirements that we have. So uh, this brings us to item A4, which is um, approving a, the formal meeting minutes of February 6th, 2024, August 27th, 2024, and September 17th, 2024. So I will moved. look for motion. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Dugan and a second from Councilmember Mono. Is there any discussion to this? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any, oh, any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Um, and I can't tell who, I, I know we have Council Member Pui joining. I can't tell if we have um, our other two council members, but. They are not attending online currently. Okay, great. Uh, it's my understanding that they were not attending. They're on a city conference in Florida. So because of the time change, um, Council Member Pui is up late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, so that passes unanimously with um, Council Members Petro and Lopez Chavez um, not joining us. Okay. Um, that brings us to item A5, which is um, a joint ceremonial resolution with Mayor Mendenhall declaring November as Native American Heritage Month in Salt Lake City. I'm going to turn the time over to Councilmember Young, who will read this resolution. Thank you. So this is our joint resolution declaring November 2024 Native American Heritage Month in Salt Lake City. Whereas Salt Lake City stands on the ancestral homelands of many indigenous nations, including the Ute, All Bands, Paiute, Goshute, Diné Navajo, Shoshone, Arapaho, Oglala Sioux, Cheyenne River Sioux, Wind River Shoshone, Cherokee, or Rosebud Sioux tribes and their respective bands, whose members have lived, stewarded, and cared for the Salt Lake Valley and the Wasatch Range for millennia. And whereas Native American community residing within Salt Lake City are a unique and diverse population representing many tribal nations, cultural values and traditions, contributing to the vibrant character of the city through celebrations, heritage and achievement. 
And whereas Native Americans have played an essential role in the economic, cultural, and social development of Salt Lake City, offering invaluable contributions through treaties, land stewardship, traditions, art, commerce, and leadership, and whereas we recognize and honor indigenous peoples as distinguished scholars, veterans, educators, athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, public servants, and community leaders whose legacy and ongoing contributions continue to shape and enhance the city, and whereas the city remains committed to fostering meaningful dialogue, improving services, and building partnerships with Na Native American residents, and promoting justice, equity, mutual respect, and shared prosperity for all. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Salt Lake City Council and the Mayor of Salt Lake City hereby declare the month of November November 2024 as Native American Heritage Month in recognition of the enduring presence, contributions, and legacy of Native American communities. Thank you. I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair, move. Mr. Chair, move that we go adopt, we adopt the joint ceremony resolution with Mayor Mendenhall declaring November as Native American Heritage Month in Salt Lake City. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Dugan and a second from Councilmember Young. Any discussion? Okay, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, Aye. Opposed? Any opposed? Uh, abstentions? All right, that passes unanimously with Councilmember Petro and uh, Lopez Chavez not present. Um, we have um, some guests that are here to accept the resolution. Um, and so we would invite you now to come to the microphone and um, say anything that you'd like. And then if you want to join us up here, we can take a picture um, after that. Thank you for being here. Um, so we have Samantha Eldridge, Director of the Center for Native Excellence and Tribal Engagement at the U of U. Um, and that's all I have listed. Sarah, who else? Or, I mean, sorry, um, Samantha, who do you have with you? Yes, and of course, Representative, Representative Angela Romero. Romero. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, City Council members and Mayor Mendenhall. Uh, my name is Samantha Eldridge. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude declaring November as Native American Heritage Month in Salt Lake City. Having lived in Salt Lake City and worked in Salt Lake City for over 20 years, this has so much meaning not only to myself, but my two daughters, instilling in them the cultural pride and appreciation that comes with being a member of one of Utah's tribal nations. The resolution not only acknowledges the contributions of our tribal communities, but also fosters an environment of learning, understanding, and building stronger connections within our diverse community. Knowing that Salt Lake City values and respects the original peoples of this land, it inspires me and many others to take pride in our identity and where we come from and to continue working together towards a brighter future. Akeha Nisago, thank you. Thank you. And uh, do you want to come join? Or, oh, sorry. Do you, did you want to make comments as well? No, I'm good. Thank okay. You, do you want to join us up here for a picture? Okay, please do. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just found out. Oh. It's a long story. Okay. Thank you for tweeting me. 
Okay. Um, we are now on item A6, which is a joint ceremonial resolution with Mayor Mendenhall declaring November 20th as Transgender Day of Remembrance in Salt Lake City. I'm going to turn the time over to Councilmember Mono, who will read that resolution. All right, thank you. This is a joint resolution recognizing Transgender Awareness Week and a Day of Remembrance in Salt Lake City. Whereas Transgender Awareness Week is a time for transgender people and their allies to act and bring attention to the community by educating the public and advancing advocacy around the issue of pre prejudice, discrimination, and violence that affect the transgender community. And whereas in 1999, Gwendolyn Ann Smith, a transgender woman, created the first Transgender Day of Remembrance in honor of Rita Hester and other transgender people who have lost their lives to violence. And whereas Transgender Day of Remembrance is a solemn yet vital occasion observed annually to memorialize and reflect upon the lives lost to acts of transphobic violence and discrimination. And Whereas Transgender Day of Remembrance also offers us an opportunity to celebrate the vibrant and diverse transgender community, acknowledging the incredible contributions, achievements, and resilience of transgender individuals. And whereas Salt Lake City is committed to promoting equity, promoting equality, justice, and inclusion for all, and highlighting transgender voices, stories, and experiences, and whereas this has Salt Lake City has the responsibility to promote prosperity for all members of the transgender community. And whereas Salt Lake City is proud to stand against discrimination of transgender people. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Salt Lake City Council and mayor of Salt Lake City strongly value the lives and contributions of transgender people express a commitment to stand against the stigma facing transgender people. Honor those lives that have been lost as a result of transphobic violence throughout the United States of America and the world, and formally rec recognize the week of November 13th through 19th as Transgender Awareness Week, and Wednesday, November 20th as Transgender Day of Remembrance. Thank you, Councilmember Mono. Um, do I have a motion? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the, the, the resolution. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Mono and a second from Councilmember Dugan. Um, any discussion to this? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And abstentions? Okay. Um, that is uh, unanimous with Councilmembers uh, Puy, Petro, and. Um, Aye. Oh, he is here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's unanimous with Councilmember. This is Petro and Lopez Chavez um, absent. Um, we have uh, Francisco Meza, the vice chair of the board of directors for Project Rainbow here to uh, receive the resolution. Thank you for being here. Um, go ahead and, and um, give whatever remarks you'd like to and then if you wanna join us up here, um, we can take a picture. Perfect. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name, like they mentioned, is Francisco Meza. I am the vice chair for the board of directors for Project Rainbow. Mayor Mendenhall, esteemed city officials and committee members, on behalf of Project Rainbow, I am deeply grateful to accept the proclamation recognizing Transgender Day of Remembrance and Trans Awareness Week here in Salt Lake City. Recognition for these days is greatly appreciated as Project Rainbow, Florist Therapy, and the ACLU work together for a full week of programming regarding Trans Awareness Week from the 13th to the 19th. Trans Day of Remembrance is a solemn reminder of the challenges that the trans community faces not just here, but globally, and it is a day to remember the names and the stories that should never be forgotten. To acknowledge the pain that persists and to recommit to ourselves and to our community in the pursuit of justice and equality. Speaking on behalf of Project Rainbow, our org was founded on the principles of honesty, inclusivity, and compassion. We believe in speaking truth, even when it may be difficult, and standing firmly against injustice and discrimination. In our mission to support and uplift our community, we recognize that progress is seldom done in isolation. As such, tonight's proclamation is not just a piece of paper, it is a testament to the city's commitment to recognizing and uplifting the trans community. While history has not always been kind to trans individuals, this signifies a step forward in acknowledging the struggles faced and the resilience shown by trans people in Salt Lake City and beyond. However, proclamations and words must be met with actions. As we move forward, let us all, city officials, organizations, and community members, continue to work together to create safe spaces, to educate and to advocate for policies that protect and empower our communities. 
After all, Utah has a deep history of inclusion of those who we now refer to as trans individuals. For example, in pre-colonial times, Native American nations such as the Ute and Shoshone acknowledged and supported indigenous people who some may know as Two-Spirit. The Shoshone referred to these individuals as Tubasa, and they were considered male or female at birth, but would later partially or fully represent as the other gender. This rich heritage reminds us that acceptance and understanding has deep roots in this land. With this in mind, let us remember that every gesture of support, every conversation that challenges misconceptions, and every policy that protects rights and contributes to the world where individuals can live authentically and without fear. In closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the city for this recognition. This proclamation sends a powerful message of solidarity and hope. Let us carry the memories of those we've lost as a beacon guiding us toward a future where acceptance and love prevail. Thank you. Thank you. And I will mention I have JC Thornton here with me representing Flores Therapy and who is also our lovely executive director for Project Rainbow. All right, thank you so much. And um, I was just gonna say for um, public benefit that there is a flag raising tomorrow morning. And so if you can make it, um, please do. I wish I could be there. I'm so sorry that I can't make it this year, but um, I'll be there in spirit. And I can't wait to um, come here the next day and see that flag waving in front of our council member, or in front of our um, city hall. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. If I could just have a quick moment of personal privilege. I just wanna say thank you for both of the for both of the resolutions of people that came to accept those and be part of our community. And I think in this, um, just the things that we've all experienced collectively over the last few years, it's important for us to recognize all members of our community and all the diverse voices that make up Salt Lake City. And so thank you for being here, not just to accept the resolution, but for being here in this city and being, being part of us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mono. Anyone else? All right, uh, then we will move on to um, the public, or public hearing section of our agenda. So these are specific proposals before the council that require a public hearing. Your comments should pertain to the hearing item, and if you go off topic, we will ask you to stop your comment. Our meeting rules apply to hearing comments as well, so please avoid disruptions or threats, or we'll ask a staff member to assist you out of the meeting. Also, as a reminder, comments that include profanity, personal attacks, intimidation, or discriminatory language are not persuasive or compelling to the council. They are not helpful in creating a respectful or safe environment either. Uh, to sign up to comment on any of these items, please register online or turn in a comment card to um, uh, one of our staff members that's here in person. We accept signups until the hearing item is closed. We will be calling the names in order of uh, how the person signed up. If you are on Zoom, please unmute your mic when your name is called. Each person will have two minutes to speak. Uh, please raise your hand in the Zoom or on either in person or on Zoom if you need assistance. If you're having technical issues in Zoom, our staff member Ellie Tran can assist you. If you reach the two minute mark, the host will announce time and your microphone will be muted. If you're unable to finish your comment, please share the rest of your, um, uh, your remarks via email 
mail, or call our office. Contact information is listed at slccouncil.com. If you have a handout for the council, please notify council staff and they will assist you in distributing that to all of us. Okay, let's see. So we're, uh, our first public hearing item is um, an ordinance for the street and alley vacation and subdivision amendment at Brooklyn Avenue. Before we begin taking comments, I'll turn the time over to Brian Fulmer, um, council policy analyst, to give us a short introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to vacate an approximately 0.61 acre portion of Brooklyn Avenue between 500 West and the West Temple Viaduct in City Council District 5. There is also a request to vacate an alley that would be rendered unusable if the street segment is vacated. Finally, there is a subdivision amendment at, as this section of street proposed to be vacated is within two subdivisions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, we will go ahead and uh, start with our first public comment. Mr. Chair, we do not have anyone registered to speak to this item. Okay. Is there anybody here that wants to speak to that item? All right. Um, then I will look for a motion. Ms. Do you want to make it? Mr. Chair, I move that we close the public hearing and defer action to future council meeting. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Mono, a second from Council Member Dugan. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously with um, Councilmember Petro and Lopez Chavez absent. Um, we are at item B2, which is an ordinance for the zoning map amendment at 1816 South State Street. Before we begin uh, taking comments, I'll turn the time over again to Brian Fulmer, Council Policy Analyst, to give us a short introduction to this item. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for property at 1816 South State Street in Council District 5 from its current BP or business park zoning to CC or corridor commercial. Thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and, and take our first public commenter. Mr. Chair, we do not have anyone registered to speak to this item. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and for action to a future council meeting. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Dugan and a second from Council Member Mono. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, Aye. any opposed? That passes unanimously with Council Members Petro and Lopez Chavez absent. Um, we are now at item B3. This is an ordinance um, for a regarding obstructions in required yards and height exceptions uh, text amendment. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I'll turn the time over to Brian again for a brief intro. Thanks, Thank Brian. You. This is a proposal initiated by the Planning Commission to amend city code and allow up to an additional 10 feet of building height for rooftop amenities with associated unenclosed shade structures in some zoning districts. In addition, the proposal would update city code related to obstructions in required yards. These changes would bring the code into compliance with recent changes to state statutes, remove outdated language, and add clarity. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and start with our first public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is one person registered to speak to this item. That will be Myra Peterson. Myra, you may now unmute. I think I am. Am I? Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thanks for having us. We own, uh, my family and I own uh, Violet Eatery on 1588 East Stratford Avenue. Uh, prior, it was um, Stratford proper. They uh, built a structure that is enclosed in the winter and heated. So the city is looking at it as a uh, dwelling in the in the winter time. Um, all around, it's an amazing piece of our restaurant. In fact, our restaurant doesn't survive without this additional seating in all months of the year. So we are just simply asking or, or looking for a motion to protect um, a very small, independent mom and pop shop local restaurant. 
Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this? All right, I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council close the public hearing and adopt the ordinance. Second. Second. I have, a, I have a motion from council member Young and a second from council member Dugan. Any discussion to this? I would, Mr. Chair, if I yep. may. Go ahead. I would just like to add, thank you for um, Violet coming to speak to this tonight. I think one of the additional things, just for um, the awareness of everyone, a lot of these structures were allowed as um, necessary during the pandemic when we were trying to you know, be cognizant of how close we were to individuals. In this specific case, we're just moving forward with allowing, even though those properties may transfer ownership, that those structures can be maintained. And I think that that's essential, especially related to some of the small businesses like Violet, who really rely on that extra space to be able to uh, serve the customers that they do. So I'd appreciate your support in supporting the motion. Well, not not to give it away, but you will, you'll have mine. <laughs> Council Member Mono? Oh, and I'm just ready to vote. Oh, okay. Um, then all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Then uh, that is unanimous. I'm assuming Councilmember Pui is with us. Um, so I am. Okay, great. That's unanimous with um, Councilmember Petro and Lopez Chavez um, absent. Okay. We are now to um, item B4, um, which is an ordinance um, regarding airport Title 16 amendments. Before taking comments, I'll turn the time over to Nick Tarbett. Um, Council Deputy Director to give us a short introduction. Thank you. These proposed amendments related to Title 16, the airports, would eliminate duplicate, duplicated and outdated regulations, move codified commercial standards to a standalone administrative documents for operators doing business at the airport, and increase fines for illegal parking. Thank you, Nick. Uh, we'll go to our first public commenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have three people registered to speak to this item. The first will be Sean Mills, followed by Alvin Chung, and then Jared Esselman. Sean is here in person. Sean, where are you at? Sean has not yet. Oh, yeah, can we uh, maybe move Sean to the end um, and take the other two? Next will be Alvin Chung, followed by Jared Esselman. Alvin is here in person. Good evening, council members. All righty, my name is Alvin Chung. A um, little background on me. I've uh, been flying since I was 16 years old. 2016 was my first solo at South Valley Regional Airport. And um, aviation has just kind of been a core of me. And to see uh, how the aviation community has been developing, uh, it's just not been very friendly to general aviation. And you know, we're looking to make some, some changes, whether it be in a new FBO or you know, helping the folks out at Salt Lake City International Airport. And all of that's being held up by this Title uh, 16 uh, amendment, I believe is what it is. And I just want to let you guys know that to the aviation community, it's, it's huge that uh, you guys move on this. So I'd urge you guys to um, vote on this matter today or sometime in the near future. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next is Jared Esselman, followed by Sean Mills. Jared's here in person. Mayor Mendenhall, members of the council. I am the, I'm Jared Esselman. I'm the vice president of the Utah General Aviation Association. I represent uh, most, if not all, of the aircraft owners at Salt Lake International, South Valley Regional, and Tooele Valley Regional. Um, I'm also the former director of aeronautics for the state of Utah, and I manage the state aviation system. Um, I, I sent you all a letter, uh, Dave Heyman, from our president, Dave Heyman. Um, in 1998, we did this very same thing, and it, and it took a year for the air, airport tenants and the airport staff to come up with language that everybody could accept. Well, this year, because of great airport staff, uh, we did it in about an hour. An hour. So we just sat down. We're all buddies. We came up with language we agreed upon. But it's been two years that we're waiting for this FBO to come out, and we're we're craving it. Um, matter of fact, we are we are losing hangers, and and we need to build new hangers, and we need to start that pretty quick. Like we needed to start it yesterday. Um, I'm I'm going to lose my hanger pretty soon. Um, 
to this. So I urge you, we've been patient, we've been very patient, please vote on this tonight, approve it tonight. Let's move forward. Thank you. Thank you. And next is Sean Mills, who's here in person. Okay. Um, well, thank you for everybody who did comment. Um, I will go ahead and look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move the council close the public hearing and adopt. I further move that the council adopt a legislative action requesting small group meetings with the administration and attorney's office to coordinate on impact fees, facility plan updates, and how administrative projects managed by the city department, city departments are handled. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilmember Dugan, an aviator himself, and a second from Councilmember Mono. Um, any discussion to this? A non aviator. <laughs> Pass confirmed passenger. A <laughs> passenger. <laughs> um, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 And um, any opposed? All right, that, that passes unanimously with Councilmember. Uh, Petro and Lopez Chavez absent. Um, we will go ahead and move on to uh, our next um, agenda section is potential action items. We don't have any of those tonight. So that brings us to the public comment portion. Um, and uh, we'll start with, uh, or we'll, we'll start with questions to the mayor from the council. Any questions? I have none. All right. Mayor, thank you for being here. Um, and now we'll go into our general public comments. Uh, so this is for the public to comment on any city, city business not scheduled for a public hearing. This section is limited to a maximum of one hour and to only those individuals who have registered to speak before 7.30. Our meeting rules apply to these general comments. Please avoid disruptions or threats. We will ask a staff member to assist you out of the meeting um, if you do not follow that rule. Also, as a reminder, comments that include profanity, personal attacks, intimidation, or discriminatory language are not persuasive or compelling to the council. They are not helpful to create a respectful or safe environment. To sign up uh, to comment on any uh, on any topic, uh, you'll need to do that in person or um, online before 7.30. Oh, and we've already passed 7.30, so you'll, um, we'll go ahead and proceed to calling the names that um, are as they came in, as they registered. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. There are 13 people registered for general comments. The first will be Claudia Alves, followed by David Waldman, and then Dwight Ashdown. Claudia is here in person. Okay, great. Good evening, council members, the mayor, Erin Manejo. Uh, my name is Claudia Alves. Uh, I live at 376 North, 800 West, Fair Park. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story regarding from my shed and to respectfully request your support. Recently, I built a shed in my side yard, a project that I undertook with care and commitment to following all necessary protocols. Before beginning construction, I consulted with my uh, city zoning department and I was informed that as long as the shed was under 200 square feet, a building permit would not be required. Part way through the construction, an inspector from the city named Elaine Carter visited my property. She reviewed my project and assured me that my shed was in compliance, granting me the go ahead and complete. Based on her guidance, I moved forward to investing significant time and financial resources to finish the shed. However, approximately three weeks after completing the project, I was surprised to receive a notification from zoning department that the shed was no longer approved. This turn of events was confused and disheartening, especially given the clear approval I had previously received. 
Today, I'm here to formally request the opportunity to apply for a variance to gain official approval for my shed. This structure has not only enhanced my profit, but has also inspired my neighbors to pursue similar improvements in, this, in the area. As a result, our block has seen a positive transformation that reflects pride in our community. Had I been given accurate information from the start, I would have Hi. made different choice. Thank you. Um, sounds like you were able to finish, but if you weren't, you can always submit the rest of your comments um, online um, via email or uh, mail, or you can, if you have them written, you can leave them with us and they'll become part of the public record. You're welcome. Next commenter? Next is David Waldman, followed by Dwight Ashdown, and then John Harrington. David's here in person. Good evening, I'm David Waldman, 784 East Edge Hill Road, District 3. I'm here with seven of my neighbors. Edge Hill is a small street with 11 homes located at the top of Upper Avenues, above 18th Avenue and just below the open space. Edge Hill Road ends with a hammerhead turnaround adjacent to our open space. Please see the map exhibit one that I provided earlier for your orientation. Road construction without notice to residents. Last week, a bulldozer cut a 650 foot long, 30 foot wide road from our hammerhead up to the city water tank. The water tank is approximately 60 feet above our homes. Please see exhibit two and three, the photos of this hill cut. There was no published city map showing this new cut. There was no public comment ever solicited on this road cut. There was no notice to the surrounding residents of this construction. On November 8th, the residents did receive a flyer in our door. However, on November 4th, the actual work was completed. So we went four days after the work was completed before anyone even noticed us. The road construction is in conjunction with the Rocky Mountain Power replacement of the wooden power lines. We are not here to complain about the fire mitigation poll work. We are not going to take up your time complaining about the scarring of the public lands. However, our complaint is the future restoration and failure. We are here to respond to the city personnel's statement that the new Edge Hill access road was both existing and the deep new cut will be permanent. The natural beauty of the hillside, as it was prior to November 4th, will not be restored. The city plan is this egregious hill cut will remain indefinitely. Someone else will continue where I ended up. Thank you. And next will be Dwight Ashdown, followed by John Harrington, and then Katie Romney. Dwight's here in person. Good evening. Apparently, the Department of Public Utilities, DPU, wants this access road to be their new primary water tank access. DPU put in writing this week that they will not pave the road, but not how they will protect the residences of Edge Hill from excessive stormwater runoff, overcrowding on Edge Hill, or public safety issues if emergency equipment no longer has adequate ingress egress on Edge Hill due to parked vehicles. The new road would encompass approximately 10,000 square feet. The road has a grade slope of 25 degrees for at least 30% of the road length. The road would create a new watershed collection basin. The new road would be a third road to the area to access one DPU water tank. The first existing access road is off terraced hills behind a locked gate. A second existing partially graded access road is off 18th Avenue at the trailhead, again behind a gate. Why does DPU need a third access road scarring the hillside? To claim an access already exists off Edge Hill is absurd. Not even a monster truck could have climbed this terrain. See Exhibit 4 map of what was approved for access roads. History of water control and damages. Edge Hill Road has a past experience of stormwater damage. Initially, the road was designed and built with poor water control plan. Today, no open stormwater sewers exist in the road to evacuate water efficiently and safety. Another person will continue our comments. 
Next is John Harrington, followed by Katie Romney, and then Susan Dawson. John's here in person. May it please the uh, council, Mayor Mendenhall. Um, this is an instance of denial of due process for the residents. This was done without any notice to the residents and what was happening. Now, we all knew for a period of time that Rocky Mountain Power was replacing the wooden power poles up behind our homes. We were assured and continued to be assured by Rocky Mountain Power that there will be remediation, that this will be restored. Now, what then happened is, is that there was a road for this large machinery that went in. And now the city, without any notice to us, has said, we want that road to be, in effect, permanent. That's wrong. That's completely wrong. We've had the rules of the game changed on us for a second time. Now, in spite of the fact that the city has given us no, no, no notice, I would like to put this council on notice with respect to what this will do. The city will have liability for this because of the flood water. There is no engineering plans that have been filed. There is no water control plans that have been filed. And what is going to happen is, is that that moisture and rain and snow is going to come down that road and flood the 11 homes on Edge Hill. Now, you folks are now going to be on notice that that's going to happen. And after that, we are going to then have further complications. The reason we've got bulldozers in there before giving notice is so that we can't go and enjoin the actions of the city. They did it, and now we have a road going into Edge Hill that will inevitably become a trail. Uh -huh. Thank will be you. you can thank thank you thank you yeah you can any other comments that you didn't get a chance to make you can make in writing and they will be part of the record thank you next is katie romney followed by susan dawson and then pamela johnson katie's here in person thank you mayor mendenhall Council members, thanks for the opportunity here with my neighbors tonight i'm here to kind of list out what our requests of the city are um, that this new access road must be abandoned. Um, after this pole project is done, Rocky Mountain Power has said that they're going to restore the area, so we'd expect this to be included in that. As was pointed out, there's already, this is duplicative, it's actually a, a triple road. Um, restoration of the hillside, it was so sad. This is like right outside my front door. I have eyes on that trailhead. In fact, I saw the meeting a week ago, Monday taking place, the bulldozer was there. I had so much faith and confidence in what the plan was, because I'd already done the public stuff. I knew it was happening. I should have known better. I should have changed myself to the bulldozer but I left for work and came home and there was a 30 foot wide road going up here there's already a tremendous amount of um, uh, let me I'll stick to the points um, ensure the water flow will not flow down onto Edge Hill, as pointed out. The turnaround um, should be reconfigured. It was already a poor turnaround. It's a dead end where every Monday, the, the recycling truck or the garbage truck, I get it confused, one of them every Monday is backing down our street. There's no room to turn around. So when I saw the bulldozer, I was like, oh my God, they're fine. Oh my gosh, they're finally here to correct the end of the road and make it uh, accessible. Winter season is coming, snow plows are coming, snow plows back up down this street already. So, um, but that's not what happened. Happened, they bulldozed <laughs> and that can't um, it really probably can't ever be uh, remediated but we would hope that they would we'd hope that uh, the signage would be posted prohibiting motorbikes um, just this last weekend there was no gate there and there was four wheeling taking place I watched it happen um, I don't mind the people that are up there I welcome them one of our requests would be to repost the no parking sign in fact I'm welcoming people to park right in front of my front door it's like five feet away but please park your car there come up and access the trail but the other side can't be parking otherwise nobody gets around a fire truck would never be able to get back out of there post that it's not a trailhead parking on one side only no parking at the 80 degree bend and no access signage okay thank you Next is Susan Dawson, followed by Pamela Johnson, and then Robert Cote. Susan's here in person. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, 
Chris Wharton and a number of you have been getting letters from me for 25 years, um, particularly pertaining to the ever-changing turnaround. The um, turnaround when we bought the house in 1998 was large enough to fully and comfortably turn around a vehicle without backing, not a K-type turn. The K-type turn it, it is a deterrent to good and experienced drivers. It's difficult, and they're having to make multiple ones to actually turn in the current hammerhead arrangement as opposed to a cul-de-sac type arrangement. Um, if that turnaround is not safe, we have the liability of that backing. Um, I have had the experience of losing a playmate to a backing truck. It is heartbreaking for everybody involved, and yet sooner or later will happen, particularly on that steep road with that tight turn where the driver does not have a good, clear view behind him. Um, we really need the signs replaced with the no parking. This would appear to be in the neighbor's interest. The problem is that Edge Hill is only 30 feet wide as opposed to, say, Terrace Hills, which is 45 feet wide. With 30 feet, we cannot park on both sides of the street and get vehicles up and down. If we have parking on both sides, we can't get a fire truck, an ambulance, or any other type of emergency equipment up there. And they are up there on a regular basis attending the trail system, in addition, and more often right. than they're attending it. Thank you. Next is Pamela Johnson, followed by Robert Cote, and then Hillary Jacobs. Pamela is here in person. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. In 1976, I bought a home in the High Avenues for $67,000. You can tell that was a long time ago. I've seen a lot. I now live on Edge Hill Road. And um, I'm just here to say that we need action and answers to the problems that have been created and the problems that have been ongoing. And just, just to reiterate, we need, we need the stormwater dealt with, we need the safety issues dealt with. We need signs. We need attention. I'm worried tonight about people about people going up the road illegally and falling off, driving off on the west side. I can just imagine it happening. I do remember years ago being awakened with a knock on my door, somebody that was in a Jeep up high in these very mountains who tipped over. My husband went up with the person. I called the ambulance. It was a long night in the neighborhood. It frightens me to know what can happen in this area with this new road. So are we gonna gate it? Are we gonna get the signs up? Are we gonna get action and answers? That's what I'm asking for. Thank you. Next is Robert Cope, followed by Hillary Jacobs and then Carlton Detar. Robert's here in person. Hello. Hi, um, Robert. I'm currently homeless, but I work. I stay at the MRC shelter in South Salt Lake. Um, I'm calling. I'm, I'm here because I wanted to ask if you had any plans about opening a working shelter, like a worker shelter, something that would help alleviate. Because there are a lot of workers that are in shelters um, due to the economic crisis, as well as you know, just disabilities and. Um, Bad luck, you know. Um, I'm only homeless because I came out here for to work for CR England, and they were the ones providing housing, and they canceled my schooling because I keep the Sabbath, and they didn't want to accommodate that. And it's I can tell it's very hard for a lot of people um, at the shelter being intermingled with a lot of the people that are there, so addicts and... Um, insane people. It's kind of sad to say out loud, but these are people that I intermingle with every day. And it's depressing, not only for the, the ones that are normal or just have disabilities, but uh, a worker shelter 
would alleviate a lot of the space in within the shelters that are already existing and how help give hope back to people that want to get back on their feet and out of homelessness and it would be like a funnel like there's a drain that's going down into homelessness from people that are in the standard way of living and there's no way back up besides you climbing back your way back up so if there was a way for people to climb back up like a funnel back into the standard way of living it could help and especially since you guys have the the olympics coming here in 2034 um you don't want to have that issue you know what i mean grow bigger i'm not a good speaker but... uh, that's okay um i'm gonna uh, take i'm gonna call myself to give you personal privilege if you can come take it um, this number, and this is the State Office of Homeless Services. And then if you have other questions, we can have a staff member um, answer those for you, okay? Yeah. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I'm also going to give my call on myself for personal privilege just to see, any. is there anyone else that wants to comment about the Edge, about Edge Hill specifically? Okay. Then I'll wait until you've had a chance. Okay, thanks. Next is Hillary Jacobs, followed by Carlton Detar and then Dirk Wham. Hillary's here in person. Hello, Council and Mayor. I am Hillary Jacobs, resident of Salt Lake City and a co-founder of Save Our Foothills. After receiving several alarming messages regarding the Rocky Mountain Power Pole upgrade project in the foothills, and after hearing Rocky Mountain Power's work plan presentation at last Wednesday's Greater Avenues Community Council meeting, I decided to look for myself. There are no words to describe the catastrophic damage that has resulted from their activities in the foothills' natural lands. Huge graded roads 20 feet wide have been bulldozed up and across slopes from Bonneville Boulevard through the 18th Avenue's meadows and to the top of the ridge above Terrace Hills. Nothing has been spared as the bulldozers have slashed through steep slopes with 15 foot embankments, grading multiple roads fanning out to single poles. Rocky Mountain Power has diverted far from their 20 foot easement because they said it would cause less environmental damage. In fact, this damage is truly, truly unfathomable and unconscionable. As partners with Rocky Mountain Power, Salt Lake City, public lands, and public utilities have allowed this to occur. Public lands have been assigned stewardship over the foothills natural lands, yet they permitted this disaster. In this arid and fragile environment, cutaway hillsides will slump, invasive plants will readily occupy the huge scars. In short, the native ecosystem foundation has been scraped away. We will witness a repeat of the consequences after the misguided 2020 trail system plan trails were cut deep into the vulnerable slopes, but on a scale that is difficult to even imagine. Who is to be held accountable for this assault on our public lands? Who has a responsibility to oversee or ensure environmental protections of the natural lands? Public lands must be held accountable for their promise to follow the recommendations in the South in the SE Group report and for the fact that they have not done so. Too many promises have been made and then broken. The foothills and natural lands have been irreparably harmed. How much more has to be sacrificed before this group is finally held accountable? Thank you. You may want to go check on it yourselves. It's astonishing. Thanks. Bye. Next is Carlton Detar, followed by Dirk Lamb. Carlton is here in person. So I said, my name is Carlton Detar. I'm a resident of a home at the corner of Edge Hill and the Little Valley. Uh, Mayor Mendenhall and council members, thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'm going to spare you repetition because you've heard it already from several of my neighbors. But I wanted to add that I attended the general, the Greater Avenues Community Council meeting uh, last Wednesday, and there was a presentation by Rocky Mountain Power and by uh, public utilities. And nowhere in that presentation was there any mention of keeping a permanent or having a permanent road from the top of Edge Hill to the water tank. So I'm urging the council or the public utilities to abandon the plans for making it permanent. We already have access roads for that and to restore it uh, as much as possible to the uh, native uh, habitat. Thank you. Thank you, Carlton. 
And next will be Dirk Wham, followed by Daniel Schelling. Dirk, you may now unmute. Hi. Um, I'm just calling in to say that as a young person living in the city, I'm very concerned about climate change and the effects that it's going to have on everybody. Um, and with that, I want to encourage the city and the council to do everything we can to mitigate the effects of climate change and reduce our fossil fuel consumption and things of that nature. Um, it's really frustrating knowing that we're facing uh, ecosystem destruction, biodiversity loss, et cetera, et cetera. And our city is largely asphalt and grass. Um, do things that are actively hostile to um, the land and the way that it wants to be to flourish. Um, yeah, that, that's really it for me. Um, do what we can to steward this planet we live on and take care of the people who live here. Thank you. Thank you. And Next will be Daniel Schelling, who's here in person. Good evening, City Council and Mayor. Uh, thank you for being here. <clears throat> My name is Daniel Schelling, and I am both a resident of Salt Lake City and a founding member of Save Our Foothills. Following the identification of problems with the 2020 Foothills Trail System Plan, tra trail construction was paused in 2021. Problems identified with the plan and its implementation included, one, lack of adequate land use and recreation planning, two, lack of environmental studies, and three, environmental degradation from tail const trail construction. The city then spent over $300,000 on a combination of environmental studies and a review of the Foothills Trail System Plan to ensure that the foothills would be carefully stewarded by public lands moving forward. However, Rocky Mountain Power's activities in the foothills over the last month have made a mockery of recent efforts to protect the foothills. Rocky Mountain Power has bulldozed 16 to 20 foot wide roads above Bonneville Boulevard and the avenues and along trails that were constructed in 20 and 2021, along the same trails that were constructed at a cost of $50,000 per mile. The Salt Lake City Public Lands Department has approved of and facilitated this work. My questions to the City Council and administration are these. One, who is overseeing stewardship of our natural lands in the Salt Lake City foothills? Two, what has public lands done to advocate for the foothills natural lands? Three, can we trust public lands to protect the foothill ecosystems after they have allowed this environmental disaster to proceed? And four, who will ensure that reclamation, restoration, and revegetation of the foothills is comprehensive? I think the city council and administration should get answers to these questions before public lands is permitted to move forward on any future work in the foothills. I also encourage all of you to visit the foothills above Terrace Hills to see the incomprehensible environmental destruction. Uh, right. You will be shocked and dismayed. Thank you. Um, just to, I just was gonna call myself for personal privilege, but I didn't want to cut people off after their name was announced. If you, the residents from Edge Hill want to stay until the end of the meeting, I can talk with you. Um, but I did hear you, I've received your letters um, and um, I'm just finding out some of the details of this myself. So I am gonna be working on it, but I wanted to let you know that if you did want to stay till the end of the meeting, I can talk to you after. Okay, thank you. Sorry to whoever I interrupted. That was the final register commenter. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, that means we're getting close to the end of the meeting. So um, we are at new business. Um, agenda item E1. This is an ordinance for consolidated fee schedule amendment regarding the utility fee waiver. Um, I'll look for a motion. No, no one. Why not? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt the ordinance amending the consolidated fee schedule to modify the stabilization fee. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Young and a second from Councilmember Dugan. Any discussion to this? 
Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any Mr. opposed? Chair? Yes. Sorry, I council member Poy is no longer online. Okay, great, thank you. That's what I was waiting for. Um, okay, um, that, uh, are any opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously with council members Puy, Petro, and Lopez Chavez um, absent. We're now to item E2, an ordinance enacting temporary zoning regulations. I will look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance enacting temporary zoning regulations authorizing temporary increase in overnight capacity at the Youth Homeless Resource Center at 888 South 400 West. Second. I have a motion from council member Dugan, a second from council member Young. Is there any discussion to this item? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, that passes unanimously with council members um, Pui Petro and Lopez Chavez absent. We are now at the unfinished business portion of the agenda, item F1. This is a resolution designating Salt Lake City Central Business District Improvement Assessment Area. I'll look for a motion. Mr. Yes. Chair, I move that the council adopt a resolution designating the Salt Lake City Central Business Improvement Assessment Area for economic promotion activities and holiday lighting. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Young and a second from Council Member Dugan. Any discussion to this? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously with Council Members Pui, Petro, and Lopez Chavez absent. We are at our final item, which is F2, a resolution appointing the Board of Equalization for the Salt Lake City Central Business Improvement Assessment Area. And look, look for a motion. Mr. Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt a resolution appointing the Board of Equalization for the Salt Lake City Central Business Improvement Assessment Area and related matters. Second. I have a motion from Councilmember Young and a second from Councilmember Mono. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. Oh. Okay, never seen none. Um, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and that passes unanimously with Council Members Pui Petro and Lopez Chavez um, absent. This brings us to the consent portion of our agenda. I'll look for a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Second. I have a motion from Council Member Mono, a second from Council Member Young. Any discussion to this? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes unanimously with council members Puy Petro and Lopez Chavez um, absent. That concludes our city council meeting for tonight. Thank you for everyone who attended. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>